in a new way. Well, life couldn't get much better. I was in school studying the Bible, uh, stimulated by all the things I was learning, surrounded by like-minded people building relationships that I still have today, way back there, I think that's maybe 40 years ago, 30 years ago, I don't remember, can't, can't remember after a while, but I was also in love, and I was with a girl that I thought, hey, I could marry her for the first time, I thought, hey, I like this girl, and... Um, but then I was hit with the worst possible scenario. My knees were swelling. They swell up. I've got, I, I have to go to the hospital to get uh, the fluid pumped out of them. You ever done that? That is as gross as it gets. They take a big syringe. must be about that long, and they just pull that stuff out. It looks like, uh, it looks like 1030 oil when it comes out. <laughs> sorry, to, sorry to tell you that, but you don't, wanna, you don't want that ever to happen. So they realized that they couldn't keep doing this every week, and so they sent me to a specialist, and a specialist informed me that I had rheumatoid arthritis. Never knew what that was, never heard of it, but the next sentence woke me up. He said, you'll be in a wheelchair within a year. Well, in the midst of deep sadness, I could not settle for this conclusion. And I prayed and asked God, why is this happening? You called me into ministry. You told me that this is where I should be. I come and then this happens. Like, what's going on? And so I just searched out anybody and everybody that could pray for me. It was friends in school. It was professors. It was pastors. It was anybody that I could find that would pray for me. On my second visit to the hospital, didn't get any better. In fact, he was emphatic that I take three pills pills three times a day to reduce the swelling in my knees. But these pills were really hard on my stomach, and I found that I was nauseated 24-7. I was in rough shape and getting worse. The pain was increasing. I finally had to quit school. I couldn't wear pants anymore. I had to put on sweatpants to get them over my knees, and I just felt rough. I couldn't walk. I was really reduced to lying flat on my back because the pain was so great, I didn't want to move. And at that point, I said to my girlfriend, and she was here last night, actually. She's now my wife. She says, <laughs> 41 years. I said to her, I don't have a future. Our dream of being missionaries is gone, and you should cut your losses and move on. And I was serious. And she said, no, I'm not moving in, not moving out. I'm going to hang in there with you. And again, she continues to do that even to this very day. She's been the best wife God could have ever given me. It's been awesome. So one morning, as I'm lying in bed due to the pain, I was so uncomfortable and wasn't sure what I should do next. Very discouraged. Then Jesus came. I'm going to come back to the story, sorry about that, at the, end of the, at the end of the sermon, and you can bet I'm coming back. Sometimes I've been known not to come back to the sermon. Oh, we ran out of time. <laughs> sorry about that. But I'm going to come back and finish that story. Uh, the Bible was written and inspired by God, and he wants us to believe and to experience all that he has for us. And when I took on this book of, of, of Mark, uh, I knew that it was, there was... It was a book of healing, nine times in the book of Mark. Even though it's the shortest, it has the most instances of Jesus healing people. So I said, God, what are you going to do? Why are you sending us here? And I believe that God wants to do some things in regards to healing among us. And I'm not giving up on that, even though, you know, we're in, just have a couple of months left. I think this is the last message on healing one of the most important words when it comes to healing is the word faith. And I've entitled this message, uh, When You're Sick and Tired of Being Sick and Tired, Understand What Faith Is. It's what you should be doing. So faith in the Bible is presented in many ways. It's saving faith. It's growing and maturing faith. And God also offers the gift of faith. Faith is so important. Faith is a verb. And that means it's an action word. That means it's like a muscle that needs to be exercised or it atrophies. It will impact faith, will impact how you think and feel and behave. 
It will mature your faith, has the potential, get this, this is very important, has the potential to change your character and your personality. Some people would argue with me, but they haven't experienced faith in Jesus Christ and the difference that it makes and can make in our lives. Change your personality? Come on. I believe that. And I believe it's changed my personality and my character. Faith requires risk, patience, discipline, and commitment. And each time we risk trusting God and we're going to wait on him and his understanding of the circumstance that we're in, instead of just leaning on our own understanding, faith will have a chance to grow. His faithfulness to us, his responses to us, we grow and mature and we have more confidence. And as Greg, Pastor Greg talked to us last, ne- last week about serving, this is where serving comes in. You're put into situations that are beyond your ability and all of a sudden you need to say, hold on here, I'm over my head. And you're faced with uh, two responses. Either you go find a couch and sit down and say, I'm not going to do this anymore. Or you dig in and you find the work of the Spirit begins to flow. Remember, rivers of living water begin to flow and you're a changed person. That's where service comes in. But, and this is a big but, we don't always get what we want and we don't get what we think we need. And there are times in my life and I'm sure in your life where you've been deeply disappointed with God's response or his lack of response. From our perspective, people don't always get healed. In fact, people, every one of us, will die. These are losses that I don't like and often don't understand. But, again, I have learned in life that God has our best interest in mind. And he may be taking you on a journey of healing. He may be taking you a journey where he wants you to grow and he wants you to understand some of these things. Even though it hurts and I'm grieved, I believe that God wants to heal us. In the last six months, we've seen many people healed. And we've seen seen some people that didn't get healed. That makes me sad. But I know that God understands. Let me tell you something about faith, what faith is not. Faith is not, and maybe you've never heard this before, a name it, claim it kind of thing where you just try to speak things into existence. A faith in faith that heals us. No, it's faith in Jesus that heals us. It's not a hyper-positivity or denying the reality of what's happening to our physical bodies, and this becomes very personal for me because I had one of my best friends. I had a vision for him about his life, and it was the life hereafter. And I went into his room, and he said, don't talk to me about dying. Don't talk to me about death. Don't talk to me about these things. God's going to heal me. And I'm going to get to heaven. I'm going to say, come on, man. It brings confusion to his family. It brought confusion to his church. It just brought a lot of confusion. We can't change the reality. In fact, to deny, deny things that really are, yeah, you got a sore throat. You may say, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah, you do. And when we deny those things, I think they're harmful for our own mental health. Harmful for the people that have to live with this And when we deny reality. That's not what we're talking about today when it comes to faith. It is only Jesus that heals. And he chooses when to heal. And he chooses when not to heal. One thing we can be sure of, he still wants us to come to him in faith. And keep asking for the miraculous to happen. Okay, if you have your Bibles, this is going to be one where you're going to enjoy because you get to go verse by verse. Love that. This is one of those passages in Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. And it's a milestone in Jesus' ministry because this is the last time that Jesus will heal someone as he goes to the cross. And there will be a triumphal entry, there will be into Jerusalem, and there will be crucifixion, and then his resurrection. So let's set the scene. Jesus is moving his way to Jerusalem. He's going there to die. He knows it. Jesus and his disciples uh, stop in a place called Jericho. And it's a place where they probably stayed overnight. They got food. They got water. They got rest. 
And then they're starting an eight-hour climb up into Jerusalem. So some of you have seen this. You've been over there and you've seen this climb. It's 3,700 3, feet. You're climbing. It's an eight-hour journey, 1,100 meters. It's dangerous. Back then it was dangerous. And it's a very difficult road. Today, not so much. But it was a very dangerous road. If you are familiar with the Good Samaritan, remember he was robbed and left for dead. That happened on this road. So here they go. Now Jesus is extremely popular. He's healed thousands of people. He's raised the dead. He's walked on water. He's calmed storms. He's fed thousands of people. He's cast out demons and evil spirits. And because of that, everybody has an opinion of him. Some think he's a superstar. Others believe he's the Messiah. Others believe he's their next earthly king. He's a miracle worker. He's an amazing teacher. Others would say, like the Pharisees, which is what we're going to talk about next week, this group of religious people, they would say he has a demon or that he's the devil himself. Uh, the crowds love him, and they want to be around him, and they want to hang on every word he says. They want to walk with him and listen to him and watch him. They're obsessed with him at this point in his life. Verse 46 tells us that as the disciples were leaving Jericho, there was a large crowd that was following and gathered around Jesus. And verse 46 introduces us to a blind Bartimaeus. He's one of those guys that sit on the edge of the street. He can't see, and he's just hoping that someone will give him some kind of donation to keep him alive. This is the situation. And being blind, not able to see, was really a common ailment during this period of time. Blindness was caused by birth defects, injury, and disease. And the blind, along with those with other disabilities, sadly, were despised and reduced to begging. Why? Because they were considered to be sinners under God's judgment. Isn't that sad? But Jesus attempted to straighten out this kind of theology. Remember in John chapter 9, when the disciples asked Jesus, Who sinned because this man is blind? Who was it to sin? And Jesus said, neither. Neither him or his parents. This has just happened. Because we live in a fallen world, these things happen. So, <clears throat> let me get into my points. Let's learn about the role, our role in healing. This is our role in healing. We know that Jesus heals, but what's our place in this healing journey? Faith sees is my first point faith sees opportunities it's not faith that says oh well this is my lot in life faith sees possibilities back to my story it was when i went from person to person who's got this gift of healing i need to find them where is the spirit being poured out in healing i need to go there explores and stretches to pursue God and keep believing that God can do things that seem impossible like he can he can help us maintain our sobriety. He can restore broken relationships. He can endure with patience in dif difficult circumstances. We can endure with patience in difficult circumstances, believing that God is alive and well, and he'll make a difference in our life. And he heals our physical body. So you need to know that every day, life in life, faith is either being built in your life, or it's being diminished. What would you say is happening in your life? How are you building your faith right now? Or is your faith diminished? Is it slipping away? Even the ordinary and mundane struggles in life, faith will either grow or it will slip away. What's the Holy Spirit telling you right now? I believe he talks to us. He helps us to understand. He's concerned about our growth and our maturity in a Christian life. And as we risk believing his promises and apply faith in Jesus to our everyday lives, our lives are changed. Remember a guy by the name of King David in the Old Testament. And David comes up against this giant. Everybody in Israel is cowering as this giant is calling him out to fight. And David says, I'm going to go fight him. He says, I've been through this stuff before. I've had lesser battles that have built my faith. I've 
killed a bear with my bare hands. I've killed a lion. I've struggled with my own bad attitude. I've been overlooked by my father. I have lots of issues, but my faith has made me strong. And, and I could go on. I could fill in many blanks of what's happened to your faith and why your faith isn't working so well. But there's no excuse. God wants to build our faith. He wants us to get off the couch. And he's training us just like he trained David every day for that great day when something comes into your life that's bigger than you. And the doctor says, here's what's going on. He's training us so that we might mature and we might grow. Verse 47, let's move on. It says, then Barmaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby. He began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Bart heard the crowd approaching. And according to a gospel of Luke, a parallel story, Bart asked some standing by, what's going on? And I'm sure Bart would have heard of Jesus in this small country, for three, the last three years, Jesus has done miracle after miracle. you got to believe that that kind of word just flourished and flowed through the whole country. The stories traveled, and so we wonder, had Bart prayed, had he wished for, had he hoped for an encounter with Jesus? I'm sure he did, because in verse 7, 47, it says, he began to shout. He knows who this is began to cry out and to shriek, and the, and the word that's used in the original language is there's a desperation and an urgency and a state of panic. As he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he really believed this was his day. Could this be your day? We're going to have time at the end of the service to pray for people who may need to be prayed for. And we've prayed for many this weekend, and we're trusting God that things will change. But maybe you've thought it wasn't that important, but maybe today is the day. Son of David, this is a messianic title. And somewhere within the last two or three years, Bart has heard enough about Jesus to be convinced that Jesus was the expected Messiah. That's what it means. Son of God means. He cried out for mercy. God, have compassion. Forgive me. I know I should be punished. But like the common belief was back in that day, something in him believed that it must be a sin that he's committed. So he wasn't crying out for justice, feeling sorry for himself, because he believed some of, that there was some wrong that he had done. He believed he should be punished. He knew that he had sin in his life. I hope you know that you've got sin in your life. That it's not by denial or by believing something different that you're maybe perfect and you don't sin. I hope that's not what you think. Because I'm we're all sinful. And we'll never get help unless we realize we can't save ourselves. We can't fix ourselves. And so we need to understand that Jesus forgives sins doesn't mean we stop sinning when we become followers of Jesus, but now we have access to the one who forgives sins. We have access to the one that can heal. We have access to the one that is merciful, and he brings hope. Blind Bart's faith could see Jesus, even though his eyes couldn't. Faith sees possibilities. Let's move on to point number two. Faith persists. Faith doesn't give up. That's why faith, that's why Bart won't stop yelling. We're told in verse 48 that people reacted to Bart's constant yelling. And many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Bart teaches us to persist in seeking the healer. Bart also could not hear Jesus above the crowd Sometimes we have a lot of noise in our life that keeps us from asking God to heal us. It might be the the desiring acceptance from others stops us from pursuing God. I want to please this person instead of pleasing God. Maybe there's a desire for privacy, not reaching out and talking about what has happened in your life. And the thing about the church that's so wonderful that Jesus designed, it was a place where we are family and we 
talk to one another about the issues we have. Don't let pride keep you silent and suffer in silence. It may be a fear of vulnerability, not wanting to look needy. Uh, you want to look like you have it all together. Well, you're kind of in the wrong place if you've got it all together because none of us do. None of us do. And maybe it's a fear of disappointment. I've heard this. Well, I'm, what if I'm not healed? Will people look at me like I have no faith? Or will they look poorly on me? Well, I sure hope not. Will this reflect poorly on, on God if he doesn't heal me? Bart didn't care. He just pursued Jesus. He was desperate. Let's look at number three. Faith responds. Verse 49, Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. And so throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet. Bart's response is an act of genuine faith. Reveals that Bart abandons all to respond. You get that? He left his cloak behind. It's time for a new life. Don't need that old cloak anymore. I'm leaving it behind. Let me ask you this question that hopefully the Holy Spirit will reveal and answer to you. What is your faith in Christ calling you to leave behind? Is it something of this world? Is it something that you know doesn't honor God but you continue to do? Is there something you must let go of in order to follow Jesus where he wants to lead you? Maybe your healing is dependent on leaving some things behind. Things that don't honor God. Healing may be blocked because of sin. I was talking to a guy this week. He was losing his eyesight and he came forward for prayer. And in the midst of the prayer, uh, someone said to him, is there anything that could be blocking God from healing you? Is there any sin in your life that God would say, let's straighten that up and then let's get into the healing story? And he said, yes. And so he went and sat down somewhere near the front here. And he wrote out an apology to some friend of his. And they had had a nasty exchange. And there was, some, there was a grudge between the two of them. And he wrote a note to her, please forgive me for my part in the nasty exchange that we had. She got back to him and said, yes, I forgive you. And in his opinion, that had something very significant to do with the healing of his eyes. And he went to the doctors and they said, your eyes are getting better. And he was so thankful that someone asked him that question. Because he could leave the grudge behind. Let's look at number four. Faith asks, verse 51. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. Wasn't that kind of a, a, a simple question? Jesus would have known but there's something about asking. And I've said it many times here, and I've seen it in the Bible. I've seen it mainly in the Gospels. Jesus wants to ask, why is that? Because he doesn't want to push us and manipulate us and shove us like a dysfunctional parent. He wants to come to him and say, I need this from you. And Jesus asked, Jesus asked that question. He says, my rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. I find many people who don't want to do this step of asking. It's maybe humbling to ask God for help. It's humbling to ask other people for help. They simply do not ask to be healed, and many would rather go see a doctor. They have more faith in a doctor than they do in Jesus. And I think what I do when I'm, when I'm sick and I need to see a doctor, I make sure that I'm praying first. God, it'd be great if you healed me and I didn't have to go through this stuff with the doctor. I think we need to have our faith in Jesus. I have faith in doctors. I love them. I go to them. I, um, I need them at times. But what about Jesus? Are we sharing with our small group? Are we sharing with people? This story that I want to show you on video is, is Leanne. And Leanne is a part of a small group. And uh, how, how many of you know that's important in this church? That's really important that you're a part of a small group. You won't be, I, I want to just tell you straight up, you won't get all of what Heartland has to offer unless you find yourself in that environment. 
Here's a story about that. I went through a pretty tough time. I felt pretty alone and it was just hard to navigate for quite a few years. Um, it was terrible mood swings, which still feels funny to say out loud, but it was mood swings that turned into an onslaught of negative self-talk that it was too much to bear. So about five years ago, my mood swings started to get bigger and more intense than they had been before that. Um, the mood swings started as something that any of us might get. I mean, feeling irritable, um, feeling low, feeling um, emotional and like I could cry at the drop of a dime. The problem became more serious though when it became like an onslaught of negative self-talk. For this week, I would experience intense times of battle in my head. There were dark voices saying to me, how could you do that? Uh, why did you treat your kids like that? Too bad you weren't a better wife. He deserves better. And I wanted to escape my own head once a month. I remember times, and it happened more than once, of standing at the kitchen counter, chopping vegetables to make dinner, and tears just streaming down my face because of the intense battle going on inside. I felt like there was an angel on one side, a demon on the other side, and I was just caught in the middle. It's like my mind had been taken over and it was just this facility that was being used to hold this war. Over time, my husband knew more and more what I was going through. And there were also a few other people that I told as well. They each knew different parts of the struggle. But I remember I had to make the hard but conscious decision to tell somebody else. Um, because I do believe that Satan tries to get us to keep secrets. And those secrets can be destructive. He wants us to feel like no one knows, no one cares, and no one would understand. And it would be too shameful to tell. But I was determined to not go down that road into something more dangerous and destructive. So even though it didn't feel good, I, I told somebody else. One year we entered into the spring prayer and fasting week that Heartland does. And I remember feeling excited and filled with anticipation for this week. During the time I prayed about lots of things, but God said to me, aren't you going to ask me about your biggest struggle? And I responded, do you want me to bring this to you, God? Would you heal me of this? I also had thoughts of this is just the way life goes. On this side of heaven, there'll be trials and it'll be better a different day. And again, that feeling of pride or shame. I was too ashamed to talk about it to even God. I had organized to have friends come over on the Friday night of that week and we prayed together, we broke the fast together. At the end, we finished our time with praying for each other, which included healing. And I brought up my request and they anointed me with oil and prayed for me. So that was it, nothing happened in the moment. I was unsure if there was healing, but I knew that I was being obedient and that God had called me to ask him this. The first month came and went and I experienced zero of that negative self-talk. I was shocked and I kind of put out my hands to God and I said, okay God, thank you. You give and you take, thank you for this one month but it's been 14 months and I've had 14 months of freedom in this. That battle ground in my head has ceased and it's never come up again. God has healed me. Isn't that incredible? God wants to heal us in many different ways. It may be mentally, it may be physically, it may be spiritual, so many ways. Well, I want to go into fifth point, faith saves. Interesting, this passage takes a little bit of a twist. Verse 52, go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Now, there's a double meaning occurring here. 
when Jesus used the word healed, he used the Greek word sozo, which is common word for salvation. He could have used another word that would be more appropriate if it was just physical healing. He could have used the word iomi, uh, which is more specific to physical healing, but he didn't. There was something deeper going on here beyond just physical healing. Jesus said, your faith in me has healed you, has saved you, has rescued you. And what has happened physically to you is also happening spiritually to you. And it appears that Bart was saved from his blindness. But more importantly, he was saved from his sin in this instance. This is so key to remember. So subtle in this passage. It's easy to lose sight of our spiritual walk as we're being healed physically. Bart is healed spiritually. He's saved. What would you rather have, your spiritual healing or your physical healing? That's a great question to ask when you are asking God that you could be healed. Because he may turn around and ask you, you want your physical healing or your spiritual healing or both? Because your spiritual healing will last for all of eternity. Your physical healing will only be while you're on this earth. That's what's happened here to Bart. Reminds me of Mark chapter 2 and verse 5, which we studied many, many, uh, many months ago. And when it says here, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. God wants to bring healing to our soul, to our mind, and to our body, to all of our life. He wants us to grow. He wants us to, to develop and mature. The reason for Jesus' miracles and ministry was to awaken people to the eternal kingdom of God. He had a desire for people to come to know him personally for salvation. And I also believe that he heals people that they might turn away from their sin and turn to him and grow deeper. So on the back side of your bulletin insert, which will be uh, back at the sound booth right, right around there, uh, you'll have the back side of the bulletin. And that will tell you how you can build a relationship with Jesus. So important. The, the word followed, sorry, I lost something. My last point, faith follows, verse 52. Mark points out, and he, that's Bart, followed Jesus down the road. Now, the, the word followed in the original language, in the Greek language, and the Greek language is very specific. And it's interesting that God chose to bring the Bible originally in the Greek language. And so any of you English majors, you might not have heard this word before. This is, this is ingressive imperfect, that word, followed. And it means the subject, which is, Uh, The former blind man started something and then continued on with it. And so Bart began following Jesus that day and for the rest of his life is what it's saying here. Did he follow Jesus onto Jerusalem? Was was he a part of the triumphal entry? Did he watch Jesus die? Was he a part of the resurrection group that saw Jesus go to heaven? We don't know. But history would tell us Uh, that Bart went on to become one of the leaders in the Jerusalem church. So he was not only healed from his blindness, but he was healed from his spiritual blindness as well. Let me finish the story of my healing. I believe that my healing had a purpose. It was intended to build my faith and trust in God, uh, that he was involved and he wanted to build that faith into my Uh, nauseated from the pills that the doctor prescribed for the because of the pain, I just prayed. Suddenly I felt this sensation, and some of you that have been healed would know what the sensation is about. It seems a bit common. I felt what was felt like hot oil come on the top of my head, and it came down, and I remember it settled down around. I remember feeling it in my ears, and then it came down into my throat, came down into my chest, and it settled in my hips, settled there for a while, and then it went down my legs to my knees, it settled there for a while, and then it went on and out my toes and gone. Well, when that happened, I knew that I was healed. And so I stopped taking the pills. Now, I wouldn't recommend that, 
to anybody because those pills, you may need those even though you can't suddenly just come off the pills. So I went to the doctor two days later, and it was another appointment with a specialist, and he said to me, he said, wow, you're walking better. Uh, There seems to be less inflammation in your knees. Wow, those pills have been doing wonders. (laughs) Now, Now, this doctor was a gruffy old guy, and I was actually scared of him. And I was scared to tell him that God had healed me. And as I sat there in those seconds, I just felt like, oh, God, you've done this incredible thing. I need to give you glory. And so I blurted out, God heal me. And just like that, he was instantly angry. And he backed in, I backed up and he said, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe in that stuff. And so he just stood there and looked at me like he was angry. And I mustered up all the courage I could, and I blurted out to him, You're scared this might be true. Okay, he said, um, I don't want to see you anymore. And I said, come on. Like, I want to show you that I'm healed. He said, okay, make an appointment for a month later out with the receptionist. And he left the room in a huff. Well, a month came by. I was, at that point, completely healed. And uh, he was surprised when he looked at me. um, And he examined me. And he used the word, kind of muttered this word, remission. And he left the room. Well, God healed me. My faith in Jesus increased, and I think it increased in my friend's life and all sorts of people that have been praying for me. And I think even this grumpy doctor, I think it probably changed his life. Did he go home and tell his wife about this experience? I don't know. But God was witnessing to him through my healing. This experience of risking and reaching out to Jesus and being healed has built history in my soul that gives me the confidence that God hears and he heals and he does miracles. So, how's your faith? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus to save your soul and to move in your life with power and presence of the Holy Spirit? Is your faith growing more alive and vibrant? Do you have a physical, emotional, relational or circumstance in life that you need something. May it be God. May this be the day that you are healed. So after communion, we're gonna, you can come under the cross here. If you have questions of anything I've said, you can stop and talk. I'm going to be down here. But we want God to do something. I really believed that God brought us to this book of Mark. That healing, maybe a healing wave, which I've seen in church before, would come upon us and we would see many people healed. Let's pray. Lord, it's so exciting to see you move. So glad that you are alive and well and living in our spirits, those of us who are followers of you. Lord, I continue to pray that you would pour out your love here in our church and and heal people. I, I appreciate what we've seen, but I want to see more. And Lord, as we take communion symbolizing your death and resurrection on our behalf, we recognize that embedded in the death and resurrection was not just our salvation, but our physical healing as well. So would you touch us, make us whole, mature us in this area. In Christ's name, amen. I'm going to move into a time of communion now. So you're going to need one of these uh, little cups. If you don't have one, uh, just slip up your hand. And our ushers will make sure you get one. As Pastor Al said, I want to invite you, if you want uh, prayer for healing, to come after the service. We also have a night of uh, healing prayer this coming Friday at 7 p.m. Uh, there's a wait list currently, but we'd love for you to sign up because we want to make sure everybody that wants to come for healing prayer would uh, receive that prayer. So there's 20-minute time slots that you'll get to spend some time with our prayer team and just listen to the Lord, seek the Lord together, and ask uh, for healing. So please uh, feel free to do that. Part of our hope that we have for both spiritual healing, as Pastor Al talked about, like that word sozo, right, is what Christ has done on the cross for us. And I read a scripture from Isaiah 6 this morning. And it just really struck me, and I want to speak it over us, is that your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. 
not for anything that we have done, but because of Jesus' body given for us and his blood poured out for us. The covenant of God for women and men, boys and girls, to be bound to God for salvation, for healing, for hope, for deliverance in this life and forever. That's amazing. And that's what we celebrate as we come to communion now. And as Pastor Al mentioned, before we receive these elements, it's important for us to consider what do you need to leave behind today? What's in your life that might be blocking your relationship with the Lord? Maybe there is something that you need to let go today to let the flow of his life come, to bring salvation, to bring healing into your lives. And one of my favorite scriptures, and I think I want to make it our prayer as we head into communion, is search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So I want to pray for us and invite you to pray that way. And if the Lord brings anything up, just offer it to him and then receive his forgiveness in place of that. Let's pray together. So, Father, we want to just take this moment of quiet. We pray that you'd search us, that you'd show us any offensive way. Lord, thank you that you just don't point it out. You want to reveal it so that we're healed and we're forgiven and we're free. So would you do that work in everyone here, I pray, and anyone with us online as well. We confess our sin now to you, and we thank you that you're faithful and just to cleanse us and forgive us of all unrighteousness because of Jesus. Amen. Well, the Apostle Paul, repeating the words of Jesus in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, says these words when talking about communion. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together now. Lord Jesus, as we take this in, we thank you that by your wounds, we are healed. That you are bruised, that you are crushed for our iniquity, and yet we have life now and forever. We receive this gift, and we remember, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 25, in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together. Father God, as we take this in and your blood was poured out, we thank you that the life and the love and the forgiveness and freedom of Jesus is an inexhaustible fountain. It will never run out and never run dry. And so, Lord, would you give us fresh faith even as we take this in now? Fresh faith in you. Fresh faith to exercise and to follow and to go where you want us to go. We need your help and we call on it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for being here today. Uh, We're grateful for this time together. Uh, If you want to receive healing prayer, we'd love for you to come forward. There'll be a team under the cross that would love to pray with you. Uh, If you have a financial gift, we're so grateful for that. You can drop that off by guest services. And uh, thank you so much for your generosity. I want to invite you to stand now. I want to pronounce a blessing over you from Ephesians chapter 1. And if you want to receive this blessing, uh, just open up your hands and and if you're comfortable to do that. And I just want to bless you with it uh, from God's word. 
I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.